Why, hello there. To receive each episode of Sacred Symbols three days earlier than the public, totally ad-free. To have your questions, comments, and concerns read on the air. To hear your name in the end credits, and to score other cool perks. Please consider supporting this show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Not only will your subscription net you benefits for Sacred Symbols and allow this show to continue into the future, but those benefits also carry over to other CLS shows too, including the video game-centric YouTube show SideQuest, the retro and nostalgia-themed podcast Knockback, and the eclectic interview series Fireside Chats. In other words, you're getting insane bang for your buck. Again, that's patreon.com slash Stand. Thank you for your kindness, generosity, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and CLS couldn't and wouldn't exist. Now, on to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Chris Raygun. Hey, hey. Chris, we're doing something a little experimental today. And I promised that we would do this a couple weeks ago on the show, I think on episode 9 or 10. We're rolling this out right after episode 11 and the days after episode 11 goes live. I want to do a podcast only about Spider-Man, Insomniac's PS4 exclusive Spider-Man. And I want to do this a little bit, again, as an experiment to see what people think of it. I think it's a nice way for us not to make one of the other episodes three hours long, for instance, yeah, yeah. and have a way for people to kind of, once they enjoy the game or if they don't care about spoilers or whatever, to kind of come hear what we think about it. Solicit a bunch of questions from the audience from patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand if you support us over there. And obviously this episode will also go live and early and ad free for people that support us on Patreon. But as I told you before we recorded and as we were discussing this, I, I don't really have an agenda for this at all. I don't really know how this is going to go. I don't really know what we're going to do. I know that I want to keep it to about an hour or so, and mm-hmm. I want to talk specifically about the game. I think we'll be able to use the reader comments and questions as a nice guide through, but I think it'll be, give us a nice way to just talk about this very big, very substantial game for our audience and for the PlayStation ecosystem. And so I want to start by asking you a very simple question. What did you think of Insomniac's Spider-Man? Did you like it? Oh, I loved it. I had a great time, constantly, like the entire time. Give me a synopsis of what, how you feel about it. I'm a big Spider-Man fan, and I've been a Spider-Man fan for a long time. I've seen like every movie. I've seen all the shows, even Spider-Man and his amazing friends from the 60s, which is like a horrendous show. Hor- awful. But I watched all of it. You know, I played what feels like every single Spider-Man game. People like to compare this to Spider-Man 2 a lot. I know that that's the big comparison uh, from, the obviously, the Raimi tie-in games. Web of Shadows, personally, was like the best one before this. I think this is the best Spider-Man game that exists. There are areas where I think... I'll put it this way. As an overall package, this is the best Spider-Man game. I think there are some aspects of certain systems like combat and swinging that are a little bit better in other ones. I think Web of Shadows has a far more unique combat system, for example. But the way everything meshes together here is so good and like the story is surprisingly well written. I was not expecting that level of detail in the story. The homages throughout the the design of New York, the the references to movies that were uh, very potent in certain moments in the in in cutscenes and in stories, I love it. It was su- it was such a nice Spider-Man experience that I haven't had in a long, long time. Where does it stand for you in terms of other games released this year? Because I know you were really high on God of War and a couple other games. So does it fall into that pantheon for you? I think God of War is still probably game of the year for me, just because it surprised me. Because I was expecting to not like it at all. It's hard to change someone who's made up their mind about it. And I was a little stubborn about it. I was like, all right, whatever, this is fine. But by the end of it, I loved it. And I, I can't argue that. But I did have way more fun. And I smiled a lot more <laughs> playing this game than I did in God of War. God of War was just impressive to me. But this was just just a solid, fun experience. And one that's that felt new and refreshing, but also weirdly nostalgic to me (laughs) i don't know how that works well but could be nostalgic because it calls back to these other games that you enjoyed or at least references these games in this ip obviously that you care a great deal about yeah i care a a great deal less about spider-man than you do Mm -hmm. as an ip but i must say i think my major takeaway from the game chris is that and maybe it's very similar to my, my, my experience with arkham i think the arkham games are probably superior from a mechanical standpoint they're different they're not open world games and they're certainly not fast like this game is but it did something to me where I am curious about this universe now. And that was the same way I felt about Batman. And I've been curious about Batman for a long time. So maybe it's not the great analog. I I loved the Batman animated series when I was a kid that got me really interested in it. And obviously the Nolan movies got me really into Batman too. So there's, there's those 
kind of touchstones for me as well. But with Spider-Man, I liked the cartoon from the 90s a little bit. I had some of the action figures and whatever, but yeah. I was more attracted to like the villains and the Sinister Six and stuff. Oh, but, yeah. And Mr. Sinister or whatever. But like what attracted me to it was, was I was like, this has the makings of what I didn't realize it had, which was what I like about Batman, which is Batman at his best feels grounded and realistic. Now, I know that that's a weird word to use. It's not really realistic. They're, yeah, yeah. Obviously. It's a little ridiculous, right? And the themes are the themes and like the the character arcs are very very grounded. Right, exactly. And even like the way like the Joker is just a madman or a sociopath or whatever, as opposed to like a guy with superpowers that comes from another yeah. planet and shit like that. And I always kind of I guess through my lens of only being familiar with Spider Man most intimately through the cartoon from the nineties, I always always like I thought Rhino was like just like some mutated creature. I always thought <laughs> that you know I don't know Mysterio had this thing nailed to his head or something like that it was like some sort of supernatural creature and maybe they are in their own respect They're, they are supernatural and scientific and unusual things happening to these guys but i was really quite impressed with like my interest in the lore and like my yeah. want to like go into it more after playing it and i liked that i no, thought it was pretty cool there's a lot of detail and, and the character interactions are so good in this like i was so shocked and how much i liked octavius and peter's like relationship in this game i was like what why do I like what? Why? Why? I've never cared about this before, ever, <laughs> and it's done so well. I don't know. It's so oh, man. Ah, I can I can gush about it for hours. It's fun. I think that the game's really fun. I think that what I loved most about playing it was swinging around. I think that that's pretty obvious. I think Insomniac did a really nice job of nailing the controls by allowing you to feather the sticks a little bit and kind of use the triggers to kind of go around with some of the face buttons but you never felt like you were doing too much like i handed my controller to my girlfriend who's not really a sophisticated game player because she thought it looked so much fun to swing around she was able to figure it out pretty yeah. quickly but by just using the r2 button and the x button and, and i really enjoyed that as well now we gave these high-end kind of opinions on the game i will note that we're going to spoil the shit out of the game at this point yeah. i would assume so if you haven't played the game yet or you're interested in kind of keeping that sacred until you play it and experience it for yourself, you might want to shut this off, download it, and put it aside for later. If you don't care or if you've already played the game and want to hear what we have to say, then this is obviously for you. So I want to throw that out there as a kind of a cautionary tale just in case. We don't want to spoil it for you. But mm -hmm. the game fundamentally, I mean, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. You know more about this than I do. But the game fundamentally is about Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And he's a 20-something-year-old, early 20s scientist he works with this professor, this, this scientist Octavius, who he respects a great deal. And he kind of lives hand to mouth, like is kind of broke and very engaged in helping others and very engaged in, you know, doing the right thing and being kind. And it was very attractive to me. I don't know if that's the way Spider-Man always is, but yeah, that Peter Parker was like an incredibly attractive character for me. And I really gleaned on to him and I actually enjoyed him much more outside of his suit than I enjoyed him in his suit when he was, like, human, you know? Yeah. So how did you like the rendition of Peter Parker in this compared to your other touchstones in your fandom? So I really liked the way they put him in this because I feel like there, there's there been a lot of attempts to do this before. Uh, I believe in the Amazing Spider-Man movie-based movie, movie tie-ins, they tried to put Peter Parker in. It was horrendous. They tried to do it in the old Raimi movie tie-ins. It was awful. They didn't even bother with the PS1 run of games. This is definitely the best incarnation of that character in a video game that I can remember. And I actually really did enjoy like the gameplay sections with him, even though, even though they were basically just kind of weird mini games that were pretty simple. The, the, the Bioshock hacking game right. was pretty obvious <laughs> as to what that was. But there were a lot of interesting story details that were happening. It, it, I feel like those sections are fed a lot by how good the character interactions are. Because the gameplay in and of itself is pretty... It's pretty standard. You're just walking around in a room where you can't really do much, and you're doing all these like little mini games that don't really have much to do with anything else. But because there's interesting conversation happening and you, it, the context of what you're doing is interesting, you kind of stick through it. I really liked it. I really liked the way they did it. I didn't care so much for playing as Mary Jane and, and Miles, but that was mostly just because they felt like stealth missions, but without any attention paid to what a stealth game actually is i felt that there were numerous times where i was like they can definitely see me <laughs> you know and it kind of broke immersion in that way which is weird because that whole those whole sections of the game are kind of meant to immerse you further in these characters so i, I thought there was a, a little bit of a disconnect it's not bad by any means it's just like so much weaker than 
the game that surrounds it. Right. That I felt a little weirded out that they were there. I felt like I didn't really want to play as either of them, that I didn't need to do that. I know that they were setting up Miles specifically for the next yeah. game, which is inevitable. But And I like these characters, yeah. by the way. Like, Miles and MJ are great in this game. For, for the first time ever, uh, Mary Jane doesn't suck. <laughs> Yeah, people were saying that MJ is quite different in this than she usually is, but I don't really have any touchstones. Yeah, Mary Jane is typically depicted as just kind of like a like a struggling actress or just somebody who's, you know, her family life's pretty rough and she's kind of broke sometimes, kind of not. But like this is the first time she's more like uh, the Karen character from the Daredevil series on Netflix where she's like a journalist who's actually trying to do things, which I thought was like a neat, a neat character change because quite frankly... Vanilla Mary Jane is not all that interesting at all. It's one of the reasons why Gwen Stacy is far more interesting. I'm glad that they made Mary Jane not suck. <laughs> it's not easy to do, apparently, because it's the first time it's happened. Fair enough. In a game, anyway. Well, I think the best way to kind of explore the game further is to just go into these questions. I, I solicited a ton of questions from the audience on patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, and they gave us a bunch of feedback. And I feel like through their questions and through their comments and their kind of inquiry, we can really explore the finer details of the game without having to go from an A to B to C kind of thing and right. feel like we have to hit these beats. So let's go in there. And again, this is all experimental. We'd love your feedback on whether this episode works or not for you, but I think it's going to work. And we'll start with Sakane Adebimpe. And I'm sorry if I'm Ooh, mispronouncing that name. That's a unique name. He says, hey, Colin and Chris, does the side content in Spider-Man suffer from open world syndrome, i.e. collectathons, or does the value rewards and value and rewards obtained from it outweigh the tedium? So I'm curious what you think about this because my take on this, Chris, is that with the exception of the random crimes that occur, like whether they're sable crimes or thug crimes or like criminal crimes, like they're basically all the same. Yeah. And each section of New York City of Manhattan has five of each, up to five of each in there. And they're tedious. It took me hours to do all of those after I was done with the game. And even though I was doing them all as they popped up throughout the game. So other than that, which I felt like overstayed that's welcome, I felt like the amount of collectibles and the use of the collectibles and how everything kind of synced up with each other with these tokens, this very unique way of putting a carrot at the end of the stick for you to do that. Yes. I felt like it all lined up perfectly. And I loved that. I really did feel like Spider-Man was his, the perfect length. Like it, it didn't need to be any longer than 25 hours or so. Yeah. I would be shocked if anyone spent more time with it than that. How do you feel about Sakane's question here, though, about did it suffer from the side content or did you enjoy it? Because you play games very differently than me, too. So I'm not even sure how deep you got into all of that. So I, I finished the story before I got too heavily into the side stuff. I did the backpacks immediately. I, I just thought that was like really interesting. And, and the costume that you get, you're rewarded with suits for what you do in the game, which I thought was like a way, uh, an awesome way to reward the player because <laughs> there's, there's some really awesome suits in this game. Particularly, the, the, there's a vintage comic book suit that has an entirely different lighting system that hits it, and it looks like it's straight out of a comic, and it looks beautiful. The token system is perfect, because, especially with the backpacks, because, again, they, there's just a lot of story there. There's a lot of character in those collectibles that aren't just kind of throwaway tokens that you just, hey, I got to pick up a got to pick up this thing and now I have it now I got to go to the next one it actually gives you some insight in, into Peter as a character and even some of his villains some of his previous fights and and how weirdly how weirdly I don't know what the word is romantic or sentimental I don't know what the word is but he he keeps like the <laughs> he kept the the menu of his first date and I thought that was like kind of an interesting insight into who he is as a person and it's it's really re rewarding I think and the, some of the side challenges where you get to fight tax, Task uh, Master at the end. There's all, everything has a, a reward to it, I think. And a justifiable one. Yeah. I like that they gave you not only the carrot at the end of the stick, that story, because I don't think that that's enough for everyone, which is totally fine. Like, oh, yeah. I think Arkham was more like that, where it's like you can do these things and pursue these villains and do the Riddler trophies, but there's no real outcome that's beneficial to you other than completion and other than story. With this, I liked that they had that currency system of the tokens, the various tokens, the crime tokens the challenge tokens, the camp tokens or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you just collected all of them and then you needed a certain amount of each kind of currency to unlock suits and unlock powers. Yeah. And I thought that that was really clever. I think that it takes a lot of design know-how and philosophy, grounded philosophy in games to be able to make something coherent like that. Yeah. And that wasn't lost on me yeah. at all. Like I was really quite impressed with that level of detail. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes usually two or three tries for games Assassin's Creed is a great example where they really try to nail this philosophy, 
But this is one of the things that they nailed right away. I have problems with the gameplay, which we'll get into a little bit later, but mm-hmm. I liked this. I liked this. Yeah, it feels like you're always working towards something. Right. And it, and that's a great feeling. Like, uh, I remember me and my friends, we, we were all playing it at the same time. It's like, oh, you're trying to get that one? Yeah, I got to do this. I, I want to get this suit. And it's just like a fun experience, even just in the meta overall, like when you're playing uh, the game alongside other people, just to like, oh, what do you have? Like, what suit did you get? Oh, did you see this yet? Oh, my God. It's a, it's such a fun it's a fun experience. Speaking of suits. Yeah. Colson Craig wrote in and said, hello, Colin and Chris. First time asking a question as I just started supporting monetarily last month oh. after taking a break due to being in school and having no money. Well, thank you and welcome back. Happy to be supporting now that I'm out in the real world in the real job world. Anyway, what is your favorite costume in the game? Did you find yourself switching costumes a lot or sticking to a particular one most of the time? So the cool thing about this, Chris, I like is that the costumes and the powers that the costume give, costumes give you are untethered, yeah. which I think is really cool because it allows you to kind of pursue the aesthetic look you want with, while having the back end powers. I must say that there's a point early in the game where they put you in some suit with the white Spider-Man logo, like the white trim on it. And I immediately, when I could, went back to the regular Spider-Man suit and stayed in it the entire game. Just for consistency, like I didn't, it, with the exception of the very end of the game where you have to use that suit when you're fighting Dr. Octavius. Yeah. So I don't know enough about where these suits come from, their provenance, like what. So I stuck with the normal Spider-Man suit. But what did you think of the suits in the game? Oh, I loved pretty much most of it. There's there's a few that I thought I did, I don't really care for the Iron Spider suit. I think it looks way too busy. But the vintage comic book suit is so beautiful. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this one. Did you, I mean you had to have? Yeah, yeah you, I looked at all that I had them. All, yeah. The vintage comic book suit looks like the Ultimate Spider-Man video game. It it's cell shaded. So like light hits it differently, it pops out of every frame. It's it's particularly gorgeous if you're doing photo mode, and you're doing like the comic book cover because it looks it looks like a comic book. But uh, the 2099 suit is is beautiful. The Scarlet Spider I love because it's because it's just a, a, a shredded hoodie, a shredded sleeveless hoodie over Spider Man's normal costume. It's like what is this? I thought the Homecoming suit particularly looked really good in the lighting engine that they had, like in, in photo mode. That that suit looks beautiful. I, I swapped out every now and then. Twenty ninety nine and and vintage are my favorite though. Yeah, I stuck with just the normal one. I like the cut up one too from the beginning. Oh yeah, that's a cool one too. But it didn't look like I wanted to just be like a consistent Spider Man. Like I don't know, it was important to me to like be consistent for the den- denizens of New York City. I guess <laughs> to know what they're looking at. I broke consistently, constant, constantly. It's a little jarring sometimes because there's a scene <laughs> in emotional scenes. And I'm there's this one emotional cutscene that was happening, and I was in like the Spider Punk costume with the mohawk and the leather denim vest. And I was like, "This is <laughs> is pretty fun." It's funny you say that because in Tomb Raider, we just did our episode 11. We were talking about Rise of the Tomb Raider, or I'm sorry, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Were you and, playing as old Laura Croft from like the PS1? Model? Oh no, was, I didn't even know that that was. An, you could uh, do that. Oh, <laughs> I was given at some point like this very native garb, this green feathered garb. Oh yeah, yeah. With like a mask and it looks stuff. Looks ridiculous. And, and there's this very serious cutscene with this little kid that like I'm doing a side quest, and he's like telling me about how something's missing or whatever, and it just keeps looking at me. And I just look like a fucking goon. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't even know you can play it. Yeah, it's cool. That's cool. I'll have to do that. Tyler Franken wrote in, and again, these are in no order. These are actually mostly in order that they were given to me on Patreon, but they're no one, not in no order to get us anywhere. So this, right. will, this would be a good question to wrap up with, but we can answer it now. With what I assume to be a massive financial success on both Insomniac and Sony's hands, it's no surprise many assume a sequel is undoubtedly in the works. My question is about timing more so than anything else. Would Spider-Man 2 be Insomniac's next immediate project, or would we see a different game by the studio arrive first? You'll see a different game arrive first because they're two teams. So they have a different team working on a different game. And remember, they have a big studio in North Carolina as well as Burbank. So Insomniac is often incubating two or three games at a time. And you will definitely see a game in between Mm Spider-Man 2 and Spider-Man. Yeah. Michael Lepper says, hey, guys, did you enjoy the time you spend as Peter Parker as opposed to swinging around as Spider-Man? In the early hours of the game, I am enjoying the break in the gameplay from beating up baddies. Thanks for the great content. We touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious. This kind of touches on, was there a moment for you where you wanted to kind of be Peter Parker when he goes to the duffel bag and takes out his out, takes off his outfit and becomes human Spider-Man or becomes Peter Parker, like human? That happens in relation to the story, but you're never obviously allowed to be that way in the game itself. And I, I understand that because it would be impossible to move around and all that kind of stuff, but it would have been cool to have that option too the whole peter parker gameplay sections weren't really gameplay sections to me i never really felt like i wanted to but it was always a treat when i was able to you know 
That's basically how I felt about it, whereas I never really felt an urge to be Peter Parker. I, I think that would have been a cool suit <laughs> if sure. you could just swing around as yeah. Peter Parker. That would be cool. for the hell of it. That would be pretty cool. I think it was just more of a nice treat more than anything else. It was never something that I wanted to pursue. I did like at the end how they, or I guess everyone knew in his life that he was Spider-Man. Like everyone knew from Octavius I like that too, yeah. to Aunt May. I thought that was really neat. I like that specifically because like, how can you really keep that secret for so long? Once you're late to certain things and you've never seen these these people in the same environment ever, and you're always disappearing when Spider-Man shows up, you have to figure at some point people will catch on. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I really like that. Exactly. Me too. Sergio DeVivo says, hey guys, trophy question. Colin, I saw you got the platinum trophy. I did. It was my 71st. What can you tell us about it? Was it a good trophy list in your opinion? If not, what was missing? Looking forward to making it my 140th platinum. And he's curious if you will get it, Chris. Will you get the platinum trophy in the game? I think so. It will be the first one I get. I like trophies like this because there's no missable trophies. That's a huge problem with me. I hate missable trophies. They're, they ruin games for people. You hate what trophies? Missable trophies. Oh, right. For people that don't know, what that means is that if you go too far in a game or too far in the story or don't do something in a specific scene that you can't get back to, it's gone. Like You can't get it again, requiring you to play it. And that shit sucks. I hate that shit. And a lot of games do have that, but Spider-Man doesn't. So you can go in with confidence knowing that no matter what you do in the game, every trophy is still attainable even after you beat the game. And that's really great. So similar to its game length, similar to its quest ecosystem and its collectibles, there was a very thoughtful kind of approach to its trophies. I thought that the trophies were really appropriate. I thought that you were getting bronzes and silvers when you probably should have gotten golds and vice versa sometimes, but that's all based on how many you know points they can put into the game and kind of squeeze into there. So I liked it a lot. I don't think anything was really missing. But again, I will say that the thug missions and the prisoner missions and the sable missions were a little much sometimes like they just since they pop up randomly you have to basically just swing around and wait for them to come up and what's frustrating too is that they'll come up ad nauseum they'll just come up constantly even if you've done them all to give you an infinite number of crime tokens basically so you also have to pay attention to where you are in the map because sometimes you're doing them and you don't need to because you've already gotten all of them in that section so that's a little bit of a bad (laughs) design i like doing them though to be honest they're fun i like the sable missions the most because they're the most difficult Jeremy Cochran says, what villain or villains would you like to see in the inevitable sequel? Thanks and keep up the great work. You two are the best. Thank you so much. I don't have much input in this. Mysterio and Sinister are the only ones that I really know too deeply that are not in it. (laughs) Yeah. But Mysterio, to me, was in it in that section of the game, like the party section. Someone's dressed up as him. Yeah. Which is cool. And Sinister, I only know from the cartoon, but I always thought he was in charge of the Sinister Six, but he's not in this one. I guess maybe there's differences in the comic lines or something. I don't know. It, yeah. But is there, who was missing from this that you would like to see in the in the future? I mean, obviously, they're setting up the Green Goblin for the next one. I think that's really the only definite definite one we have for the next one. I would really love to see Mysterio because I think Mysterio is one of the... <laughs> he's one of the weirdest villains because he's treated so poorly. <laughs> and he's pretty lame. For all intents and purposes, because this is Insomniac's own universe and they've taken so many liberties already while still paying homage to previous works, I think they could make a really formidable and interesting Mysterio. Also, obviously, the symbiote's Venom is not in it, uh, which I didn't really expect. Um, I didn't expect Octavius either. I think Venom and Venom, Mysterio and Goblin are the, are the three. What's the difference say. between Hobgoblin and Green Goblin? I remember having a action figure when I was in the mid '90s when I was younger. A hobgoblin on his little the orange hood. Yeah, and he yeah. grew the pumpkins with his head like an arm motion. Yeah, like I don't know that the whole the lore on that is like all over the place to be honest. And I had Shocker too, where he put out he, he put out his arms. I like Shocker's character a lot. Yeah, I didn't. Re- I always thought he was shooting electricity, but I guess it's like be- like waves of energy or something like that. Yeah, it's like I, shock waves. But w- hence, the, well, I guess the name Shocker, I thought it was like, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, when I was a kid, I thought similar. But he had like a thing where you put these things into his arm and then you could pull them out of the back of his arm and shoot them and he shot them straight ahead. I always liked that villain a lot. He yeah. was kind of the bitch villain though in this one. Well, actually, Kingpin's kind of the bitch villain in this one because he goes down first. Yeah, kind of. Mysterio's always been the bitch villain though. In Sp- Did you ever play Spider-Man 2, the, PS- the PS2? No, I don't think no? I played. Uh, the only other Spider-Man game I've ever played was Web of Shadows. Which was the one where you can play as the four different Spider-Man. I like that one. I like that too. That was a good one. But uh, in, in Spider-Man 2, Mysterio's in that. And you he's he's robbing a convenience store. And there's a whole boss setup where his health bar goes way up. And then you walk up to him and punch him once and he dies. And he, That's cool. He's down. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. He's a little baby. I love it. Well, I like the idea. Batman has villains similar to that, like with Riddler and stuff, where like once you get through all the obstacles and you get to the person himself or herself, it's like it's over already. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Like, yeah, it's about getting through the obstacles. No, I love it. Yeah, it's neat. 
Tyson Williams says, I like that when you walk in the street, you can just press square to do small interactions. Occasionally, a person will ask for a high five or a handshake. It doesn't affect the central gameplay, and some may see it as unnecessary. Do you think they should add more depth to these sorts of interactions between Spider-Man and the citizens of New York in a sequel? Or maybe just more variety in the interactions? Or just keep it as it is currently? There's a trophy attached to this, and I didn't even realize it. when I got it, I was like, what the hell is that? And it's like, interact with 10 people or something. And I'm like, I didn't yeah. even realize that I was really doing anything. Because every once in a while, you'd like people would wave or take... I liked how people had their cameras out and were like, take videos of you when you were beating the shit out of people and stuff. That's really cool. It's, there was a lot of nice touches in it, but I think that that's enough. I don't need any more than that. I think the only thing that needs to be really refined i would love to see man i would love to see brooklyn or the other boroughs for once because i i feel like the division's really the only game that i've ever seen that's get that gets the scale of manhattan right like the streets are as wide as you think they are and like the buildings actually feel as tall as they are and this one obviously because it's an open world and you you, you know you have a limited map space everything does feel kind of crunched together and you notice that when you're in like grand central or you're in union square and it's like half it, it would be nice to uh have a bigger map far more to explore to be able to cross bridges but as far as the civilian reaction uh, interactions go i think i thought it was fine maybe a few more interactions wouldn't hurt but i'd imagine that's not too difficult to implement so it's not really that big of a focus well with all the games taking place or i mean sorry with spider-man's universe kind of taking place in and around new york and with the assumption that insomniac now has a nice baseline in which the base is sequel off of they could conceivably keep New York City or Manhattan exactly the same and then build out maybe yeah. even just Brooklyn and Queens. Even if you don't want to go to Bronx and Staten Island, at least have a way to cross the bridge and go or towards Long Island and, and explore those places as well, especially because Spider-Man is from Queens. So it would be cool to have that. I agree. But I understand why they didn't do it. I mean, oh, yeah, I was actually pretty impressed with New York City's rendition. Like oh, Manhattan yeah. It looks, rendition. it looks beautiful. Like, There's a lot there, of detail there. Yeah, too. there is. Obviously, a lot's missing. But when you're in certain parts of the city, it's like, all right, this is about right. If you're you know in Battery Park. They call all of northern Manhattan Harlem, for instance. Like, there's a lot of, like, weird yeah. things that don't really make an incredible amount of sense. But I liked what they did. I thought that it felt quite alive. It didn't it, it didn't feel quite right when you were on the ground and standing still because, obviously, the game can't generate enough cars, enough traffic, enough foot traffic to make it really feel like New York. And I felt like it was way too clean. It wasn't, <laughs> like, gritty enough. And I'm not talking about, like, trash and graffiti, but it just didn't have that grit. But, yeah. But to his point about his interactions, Peter Parker's or Spider-Man's interactions with people, the cool thing about playing it for me was that everyone loved Spider-Man. It, you weren't playing as like the anti-hero or a Batman type guy where everyone doesn't really know what Batman's doing and no one really trusts him. Like he's on the good side of the cops. Even if the cops like sometimes scold him when he's beating the shit out of people, they're like, leave it to us next time. And then you just like swing away, but they're not like shooting at him or trying to fuck with him. Yeah. I liked that. I know that that's probably accurate to the IP, but... No, I liked, it was really cool. I, yeah. I like that he had a Twitter account <laughs> in the in the map screen. People were tweeting about him and, and taking pictures of him. I, I really like the the way the city reflected off him. Me too. Mm -hmm. Zachary Parkerson asks us what we think about the new wildly different Mary Jane Watson. You had mentioned this earlier, but I don't know if you have anything else to add to it. I'm curious why you think they might have done that. Is it like a female empowerment thing, do you think? Is it a just giving MJ more agency over her own life, making her more dynamic? Because... It's surprising to me to hear that she's not always like that. Like, I didn't know that she was. It's weird whenever you say, is a character like this? Because there's always a comic run of some character where it's a completely different take. I'm, there are some runs in the comic where I'm sure MJ is incredibly, you know, strong-willed and does all sorts of cool stuff. But the typical incarnation that we see, you know, especially in the films and in the show, is pretty lame. And this was the first time that we've seen... A Mary Jane Watson that was closer to... I feel like they built more of a, of a Gwen Stacy kind of archetype out of her, which is... And who is Gwen Stacy? She, Gwen she's, Stacy a spider, was, she's a spider character, isn't she? She was Peter Parker's first girlfriend. Oh, okay. Are you familiar with Gwen Stacy? No, I always thought that Gwen Stacy was like an actual car, like an actual superhero. No, Gwen Stacy was his girlfriend and, and Spider-Man killed her. Really? Yeah, because the Green Goblin... There, I mean, there's many interpretations, but essentially the Green Goblin throws her off something and he tries to catch her but i guess the momentum snaps her neck from being caught oh wow so it's it's a really That's good dark it's a dark story they it's a great moment in that in that character peter parker is always going through horrendous shit. <laughs> he doesn't catch a break really did this gwen stacy know that spider-man was peter i'm not entirely sure there's different there's different incarnations as far as i've seen i think so but that's dark. I didn't yeah, that. it's super dark. It's a, it's a great story, though. I was interested in that, though, because one of the things I noticed was that you're always fighting on top of roofs and stuff like that. And Spider-Man just booting dudes off the roof. right? Yeah. Like just, yeah. And I was like, oh, I didn't know Spider-Man killed people. Like Batman's always like, you know, going out of his way not to kill He's anyone. He's killed people. 
Well, I guess in this he doesn't. I don't know because like I paid attention. Yeah, yeah you they, like the, if I, they like, fall off a yeah, building, they, they get like, webbed. They, yeah, it's like doesn't make any sense at all. But it's like to stop them from. But he does. He does kill people occasionally. Yeah, he's he's had some moments. <laughs> he's had moments. He's not like this uh, huge Batman kind of guy. Batman also started off killing people, by the way. Well, why wouldn't you? I I made this yeah. point years ago. I'm like. If you're it was tired something of with the Joker. Why don't you just kill him? Yeah, it was something added like a little bit later on in the in the comics that was like m- taking a more moralistic kind of approach to like this is a person we need to look up to so we can't kill. Right, and he wants to I guess remain true to his code. Yeah. since his parents were murdered. Right, but blood. it also doesn't make any sense. No, it <laughs> like, doesn't. A- anybody over the age of like seven could see the flaw in that reasoning. He would have much less to do if he just killed people. Yeah. Esteban Valentin wrote into us. And said, good day to you both. Amazing work from the bottom of my heart. It's truly amazing work, and my weeks would not be complete without it. Thank Aw, you so thank much. Thank you. Esteban, I appreciate you. What does Insomniac need to improve, in your opinion, in the sequel to Spider-Man? For me, the obvious, indoor sections need work. Felt too clunky. And what other cities would be good to explore as Spider-Man? Or should they just expand New York even wider? Well, we already dealt with that, so we'll leave that yeah. aside. But I'm curious what you think didn't work. Because for me, two things didn't work at all in the game. One was like when you were trying to be slow and methodical. Mm-hmm. Spider-Man has a magnetism towards the nearest bar or the nearest like wedge. Like there are these challenge missions where you have to swing around and destroy these bombs in a certain amount of time. And like they were so frustrating to me to get gold on them because he would like hop in and then like roll and then immediately jump up to the next thing. The game always assumes that you want momentum and doesn't do a nice job of realizing when you don't want it. And that's a huge problem for me. I, I felt like when the game was slow, I used in my review, my video review on side quests. You compared to watch Sonic? Sonic, because it, it, it felt like that to me, where I'm like, if you're moving, the game feels like this is what it wants. And when you're not moving, the game doesn't feel like this is what it wants. And that right. was, they, they got to rectify that for me. I didn't have too much of a problem with making precision moves, I found. Especially once I unlocked it, there's a specific move where if you press square and X at the same time, it like pulls you immediately. It's like an attack, but you can use it also as traversal. And once I figured that out, like those bombs were like a breeze. But I could see why they they definitely do need to refine, especially in the indoor sections. I do think he moves a bit, a bit, <laughs> a bit jolty in indoor sections. I really like the combat. I like the combat more than the swinging, honestly. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the combat. The combat to me seemed Arkham inspired, mm-hmm. but went in a different direction maybe it was a little too complicated for me to realize like i look at the move list every so often and i'd be like i can't remember all this i was just using the same you know square tapping and occasional triangle and right. obviously pairing out of the way seems like i didn't even know about this move but i felt like my major problem there was the, the, the combat was perfectly acceptable and i had fun with it and i felt fast and it felt like i was powerful and all that kind of stuff which was great but I also felt like, and my complaint, this is a common complaint for me where I'm like, I don't understand why you layer upon layer upon layer moves that the game never requires you to use. I would like a game that's like, these are the four things you can do, and this is why you want to do them, and this is how you put them together, and you have to do it. While right. I really was getting through 95% of the game, including against the bosses, doing the same exact thing. And it, so it felt a little monotonous to me in that way. <laughs> it's interesting that you say you felt powerful. I felt weak for so long. I felt weak for the majority of the game. But I was I was playing on the hardest. Oh, you are. Because my play- assumption was, I was that, playing on normal. Yeah. right? Because my assumption is that in a free roam game like this, the AI is going to be a little bit more limited because there's so much of it acting at once. So I was like, okay, I want I want to have like some kind of challenge here. And I found myself on spectacular using a lot more of the mood sets, switching between a lot more of the gadgets, using a lot more counters, and uh, using a lot more different combat moves, and it felt a lot more engaging. Then I assume it probably would have on. I could see how on normal or on a lesser difficulty it could feel probably more like square, 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 square type deal. But I, I, I was dying a lot. I, I died a bunch. Yeah, I mean, that, especially that probably, those freaking snipers, man. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't die that much. I, I died maybe ten times or something in the game. I don't know. Mm. Usually because some snipers got me a few times. They're very powerful. But yeah, to me, I, I wanted something a little more refined, and because I felt like Batman Arkham games were a little more refined in that. It didn't have quite as wide of a move set for me to use. Almost like God of War, where it's like the button combinations. I'm talking about old God of War too, where the yeah. button combinations. It's like this. This is kind of your three attacks, and it's like these are the permutations you put them together in, and it kind of makes sense. It's funny you brought up the gadgets because I kept forgetting that I even had any. Like, oh really? I would use only the webs and the electric web, and that's pretty much it. The other ones, unless you had to use them at certain times, mm-hmm. like the, like there was the mine one. To I, there was a trophy attached to that one that I, I got, but. It was another thing where I'm like, there's so much shit here. There's almost too much here 
that I don't think I ever really needed. But I appreciate that they put it in there for people that obviously like you that want to use it. Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with the gadgets. Yeah, I think the combat for me was more or less okay. I I I, I would like to see it more refined. But for me, the swinging. As much as I really do think it delivers on the feeling of being Spider-Man, and it, it feels very good and really fluid, there's a sense of, I can't really mess up, can I? That's going through my head constantly. And I, and I know that they were talking about, like, should we include fall damage? Like, that was a discussion that Insomniac was having with internally for a while, even, like, leading up to release. They were, like, trying to decide whether or not they should do that. A thing that bugged me immediately was whenever you swung low to the ground it would pull you up away from traffic, which I get why they did it for the sensation of it, but that also kind of makes it feel like I'm not really doing anything cool. You can still chain together some pretty cool momentum, uh, momentum-based moves, and you can still do a lot of cool things with traversal, but the lack of risk of f- losing momentum, because it's so hard to lose momentum, so without that risk, it almost feels kind of disengaging to me. And I would like to see maybe a little bit more consequence for maybe not timing something right or any number of things. It's still very good, though. Like, it's, it's swinging around is still so much fun. But I couldn't help but wonder, like, wow, this would probably be a lot more fun if I knew that I could, you know, hit a wall and possibly die. <laughs> sure. I don't know. No, I agree with that. I, I think the game was very forgiving mm-hmm. in that way. But it's balancing the fun factor, I guess, with the realistic. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they. Of- I'm sure they tested all these things i'm sure they tested fall damage and people were dying and it was probably not a good flow for the game probably wasn't fun jared smith says colin at best you are going to be neutral on this question so this is for chris okay chris do you see the game potentially becoming the kickstart of a marvel video game universe it has definitely laid a solid foundation do we see this and crystal dynamics upcoming avengers game existing in the same universe obviously the avengers game is slated to be on multiple consoles so that creates an additional question what are the chances that the sequel to this game is on more than just playstation does that happen or are we potentially looking at the very early days of the movie universe where spider-man exists on his own i can tell you that spider-man if there's a sequel to spider-man it will be a playstation exclusive as far as what happens to the other games i'd be interested to see what you think if this is the beginning of something i really hope it's not the start of a <laughs> of a cinematic universe or like some kind of mixed universe thing because first of all i'm kind of sick of that i really do like contained stories i do like that the avengers exist in this universe there's obviously avengers tower i do like that jessica jones exists in this universe i like that daredevil exists in this universe and you can tell that by a lot of the landmark tokens are like josie's bar and that's the 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 boxing ring where matt murdoch's dad fought and you know oh hey look the the bull in wall street is the dog from the inhumans so they exist i think that's cool but i'd miss the the contained nature of what used to be superheroes. I miss that. And especially with Spider-Man, who I think deserves a lot of attention to his universe because his story and his immediate group of characters and his rogues gallery is so cool and interesting. It's not the most exciting thing for me to hear that that's a possibility. But also, I'd imagine it's incredibly difficult to manage a consistent canon and a consistent aesthetic between two studios that have nothing to do with each other who are releasing on completely different platforms. I'd imagine that's probably not what's happening. Yeah, I would be shocked if they maintained a consistent canon. There's a perfect storm that happened around Spider-Man on PS4 that that made it so Sony's ownership of Spider-Man in terms of the film properties, or at least at the time, like you know the film kind of aspect of Sony, Insomniac's relationship with PlayStation, PlayStation's relationship with Sony mothership, all of that kind of like incubated and allowed this to become exclusive to PS4. So there is that component. But I would be surprised if if Marvel wasn't interested in making more of a bigger universe. And what I would be really interested in, and I think it's possible, although I don't really, I don't, ha- I don't know anything about this, is why not give Xbox a, an, an exclusive too? Like not a Spider Man exclusive, but give them something else, Captain America or something like that. You know, hmm. like fair play for everyone. Make this this larger ecosystem that requires you know some buy in from different people and different stakeholders. I think would be pretty interesting. I'm over the cinematic universe deal. I mean, I am too, but I just would be shocked. Like, it always seems that that's their intention. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Disney, anything Disney touches, that seems to be their intention. Look at Star Wars. I'm happy enough with references to things that have happened yeah, I like, in other properties. I'm, I'm happy. I'm fine with that. I don't know anything about Black Panther or Wakanda or whatever that country is, but the, I like that. The Wakanda the, Embassy yeah, is the there. the Embassy is one of the places, which is cool. I really like that Josie's Bar was there. That was cool. Andrew wrote in. It's like Colin and Chris, Spider-Man is my favorite superhero along with many others because of the everyday type of person Peter Parker is. With that said, why is everyone wanting to push him to the side and give us Miles Morales? Thanks, you guys. 
I don't think everybody's quick to toss him aside. I think that what I think the obvious thing is that we've just seen Peter Parker for so long, and Miles is kind of an interesting character who's like particularly different. So I think it's more of just hey, we've seen Peter Parker in how many movie incarnations, how many cartoons. It's more just hey, this is a cool different Spider-Man. I don't necessarily think it's pushing Peter Parker aside. I think I think he's had plenty of time to win over the hearts of my hearts and minds of millions of people. Yeah, he's gotten his shine for sure. Yeah. Aaron Manig- Manganin says about the controversy about DLC. Don't most games have season passes announcing upcoming DLC such as Tomb Raider, Red Dead Redemption, and Assassin's Creed? Is there a difference between this and The City That Never Sleeps? No, that's a perfectly fair point. Yeah. No, I can't argue There's that. There's no difference there. No. Yeah. That's a fair point. Shrek Crocs wrote in and said, What I've noticed while playing and what you mentioned in your review is that there are some areas that can be built upon or improved in some aspects of the game, such as side missions or stealth. Do you think some developers deliberately leave some aspects like this underdeveloped so they can more easily innovate on these aspects in an inevitable sequel? No. It's the exact opposite, actually. I think they need to get the main part of the game right, but they also want to make the game... They also want to put more into the game, but obviously the stuff that's not swinging around as Spider-Man is going to be not as important as... It's more just to make the game well-rounded, I think, and to have different play styles uh, catered to. AAA game development is like an upside-down pyramid, and it starts huge and it ends up small. You'll always hear those stories, and we've talked about that, I think, on other shows before. They get into rooms together. They have all these design docs, pre-production. They want to shove as much into the game as possible. And then they realize we have A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and we can only make A and me work right now. We don't even have the time to deal with C, D, E, F, and G. Mm-hmm. And then they make a sequel and they're like, well, A and B works. So now we can bring C and D in and kind of massage those. And that's typically how it works. So you often hear that in series... The second or third game is the encapsulation of what they originally had envisioned for the game to begin with, which is usually why those games are better than the ones that came before. So Mm. no, no one's leaving things out to make it easier on the back end. Because remember, there's no guarantee that this game was going to be good. There was no guarantee that Insomniac would get another contract for the game. And technically, there is still no guarantee that it's going to happen. Although, spoiler alert, it's definitely going to happen. Jonathan Boyd writes in and says, how does Spider-Man compare to PlayStation's best comic games, Infamous and Batman? We already talked about Batman, but I'm curious how you feel about Spider-Man's comparison to Infamous because Hmm. Infamous being a proprietary PlayStation product, obviously Sucker Punch, very well known for making those three Infamous games. They're working on Ghost of Tsushima now. That is, there is an analog there. They're both superhero games. I love Infamous. I think Infamous is a fantastic series. I think that the one on PS4 is weaker than the ones on PS3, but I think that those are really dynamic and fun games. And I'd go as far as to say that I think Infamous 2 is probably a better game than Spider-Man. But, you think so? Yeah, I think so. But it's been a long time since I played it, so I can't, you know, it's been, what, seven years? It's more than seven years, so it's been a long time, but I love that game. So what do you, would you draw any analogs to Infamous? You could compare a lot of the aspects of the game as far as how it plays. It is a very, it's obviously an open world and you're doing a lot of crazy like flips and stuff and it's, it's very traversal oriented, gliding across like power lines and stuff, which is actually kind of similar to Sunset Overdrive's uh, traversal system, now that I think about it. I don't know I, how it compares. I really I don't remember much about Infamous 2, so it's really hard for me to draw a direct comparison. I remember enjoying it, but at the same time, this has a lot going for it that that game didn't, namely a character that I already adore, and <laughs> a lot of nods and a lot of character development that I actually do have a long history of caring about so it's it's kind of rough to compare them in my opinion that makes sense yeah i don't know how i don't know know how that's fair for either of them yeah that's fair that's perfectly fair ahmed barwari already asked a question that we answered before but i'll answer it again he says hey guys will spider-man games always be a ps exclusive from now on or does how does that work loving the show as far as i understand because sony published this game and there is a i'm sure between marvel sony and probably insomniac a multi-game agreement that Sony funded it and therefore will get the perks of getting the sequel on their console as well. So you can pretty much bet Spider-Man 2 is going to be a PlayStation exclusive probably for the next console. Josh Routzon says, Hey, Colin and Chris, really enjoying the show and content. How will Spider-Man stack up in this year's Game of the Year discussion? Love to know your thoughts and keep up the good work. This is a great question. Where does this kind of stand in terms of how you staggered your 2018 releases in your own mind so far? I think God of War is at the top right now. Obviously. I think honestly, Detroit. I just I'd never finished Detroit. <laughs> I just never. I never did. It's impressive to me the tech is and just like the the numerous scenarios that they managed to stuff in there based on pure choice is impressive to me. And that might 
give it a leg up on Spider-Man to me, but I just I just had so much fun with Spider-Man. It's got to be second place for me, and then third is probably Detroit. Spider-Man's certainly going to be in my top 10, I would assume. If nothing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But I, th- I think Detroit and God of War are both better games. But mm-hmm. that's just my perspective, and not a popular one, by the way. I mean, that's not... First of all, Detroit well, I think God of War is better. Detroit being better than both of them is very unpopular amongst the internet. <laughs> Brad Niederlander and Joseph LaRussa both asked similar questions. I'm going to read Brad's though. He says, greetings, Colin and Chris. I just have a simple question for you guys, which is how do you feel the game captures New York City? If you think they missed the mark, then what do you think they could have done to bring out a more realistic New York City? Joseph LaRussa, I will read his as well because he's a fellow native New Yorker from Long Island. He says he found it disappointing to run around New York City and look for landmarks and streets I know are there but aren't. And when I went to where I currently work only to see it looks nothing like reality. Did that break the immersion for you guys? And we've talked about this before, but I just don't know how accurate you can make it in a video game. I don't think it was particularly that immersion breaking. There were points where I was like, oh, I wanted to find a building and I couldn't find it. Do you know the Sony Plaza? No. I don't it's, so. it's a weird, iconic building that I had no idea was actually in Manhattan for some reason. I've never seen it. But I've seen it in like all these Spider-Man games. It was killing me yesterday. I was like trying to find this really obscure building. But it was it was there. And there's there's a bunch of stuff there that's like obviously scaled down. I, I, I said it earlier, I think I think the Division captured Manhattan probably better than anything I've seen. It's a shame that they only gave you such a small area to play in, especially when they promised Brooklyn and like the entire island of Manhattan. But I think I think I, I didn't think it was particularly immersion breaking. I think they did a, I did they did a really good job for what they wanted to do. It feels like a Spider-Man game in New York City and New York City looks like New York City, so no complaints from you then. Yeah, I agree. First of all, I don't know Manhattan well enough to know that this, this, and this is off necessarily. I, mean, I know parts of it very yeah. well, but I'm not from New York City. I'm from Long Island, so it would be different. If the game took place on Long Island, then I'd have many critiques for sure. <laughs> I'm going to skip ahead. We have three questions. I want to start with Ryan Lemieux, hopefully mm-hmm. associated or related in some way to Mario Lemieux, Pittsburgh Penguin great Mario Lemieux. Being a big comic book nerd, I was wondering, does playing through this game give either of you any desire to what, whatsoever to check out Spider-Man in comic book form? I know Colin has said he's not a comic guy, but I'm not sure about Chris. Well, you're already invested in that. Yeah, I don't really read the comics. I'm more so just kind of get the synopsis because I just I <laughs> I can't read comics. Like the, the it's similar to what you said earlier. Like the panels, like I don't know what the he- what the heck I'm seeing, especially when like speech bubbles are like going across panels, and it's like what what I nah. I, I just I'm familiar with the story and I'm very familiar with the lore of this character and all of his all of his incarnations, a decent amount of his comic comic incarnations, but mostly the games and films and t- and TV shows and one off like big comic issues. But I I don't really see myself going to like going to a comic book shop and trying to read through every single issue I can find because to be quite frank I know most of it tangentially anyway, so I have no reason. Yeah, there's nothing that's gonna make me want to read the comics. Because I, I just don't vibe with them like we said earlier. But yeah, absolutely more interested in this universe for sure. I think the last Spider-Man, anything I saw were like the early 2000s movies maybe or something. Which I thought were fine. I know some people hated them. I thought they were fine. No, I liked them. John Apocalypse writes in and says, Dear Colin and Chris, as of writing this, I have just beaten the game and see they obviously are setting up for a sequel. Do you think they should add characters that aren't related to Spider-Man like Iron Man or da- Daredevil for the next game? I would personally not like to see any other heroes, but I wouldn't mind villains like that one character you have to do to the challenges for that would work with Spider-Man, such as Bullseye or the Serpent Society. This is way above my head, I guess, but do you feel like that this would make sense to bring in other Marvel characters? These other guys are involved in the Avengers, aren't they? Yeah, well, uh, Iron Man is. I think it would be cool to have Defenders tier characters like uh, Luke Cage. and Luke Cage was in Web of Shadows, by the way, and he, he was great in that. People like Daredevil and and lower tier kind of Jessica Jones, I think, would be great. And they've established that they exist in this universe already because they've shown their, uh, obviously, they, they've shown Alias Investigations has a location. They showed Nelson and Murdoch has have their has their offices in Manhattan. I think that's as far as you want to go, though. I don't, I don't know if you necessarily want to put Iron Man in because that that brings a whole list of that that's a whole nother tier of Marvel above where Spider-Man is because Spider-Man I would argue is a neighborhood he's the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man he's like a low he's the highest of the low tier characters he's not fighting aliens or he shouldn't be fighting aliens because <laughs> what, what so <laughs> I'm just thinking of this in, in my head Spider-Man in space yeah I don't know how, how, how deep or how far it goes it seems like he deals it does, with like but the it, clutter of New York City or it whatever. does but like he belongs in New York and he belongs doing what he does in this game 
But yeah, I think characters like Daredevil could work because they're very minor and they're not like cosmic gods like all these other Marvel characters. Uh, so I think, yeah, as like side characters or maybe people you could do missions for or uh, any number of things could work. But you don't want to put a character in there that outshines the main hero, I think. A standalone Iron Man game would be pretty cool. Maybe that could be the Xbox exclusive uh, yeah, maybe. edition of the cinematic or the game universe that you don't want to see. <laughs> Final question comes from Christian Doolin. It says, Greedos and Salacious Crumbs, guys. Sorry about that. Shut up, Christian. <laughs> Do you think I can play Spider-Man with a stealthy and more methodical play style? I'm a little concerned with the issues you, when you talk about me, highlighted regarding Spider-Man's awkward, slower movements. Could this be improved somewhat with a future patch? It could be a game breaker for me. Thanks. I appreciate your hard work. Well, Christian, Chris and I have a have a complete difference in opinion on this because he doesn't agree with my 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 complaint about that, which is totally fine. It's subjective. But it was a, it was a problem for me. You can play it stealthily. Uh, there are points where it feels like, I don't know if this was a bug or or maybe it was just part of it, but like in some of the bases where I'm like stealthily taking people out, there's a point where I know that I was stealthily taking people out, but the next wave comes anyway. Yep. So you you do have to, in certain situations, you do kind of have to just fight, uh, but you can play stealthily for a time, and it's fun to do it. It's it's fun to you know get behind people and like distract them with hitting some container with like a little web thing and like having characters walk off their their beaten paths. It's it's fun to do that. But you can't go through the entire game without fighting. It's it's just not going to happen. Yeah, it's it's funny because I was thinking about that when I was reading the question. You brought up the great example when you're doing the sable bases or like the thug bases on top of the roofs and stuff or the prisoner bases. Yeah, you can wipe out an entire wave of enemies and, and they're all dead. But no matter what you do, the next wave will see you. And so I understand that that you can't get around that. But it would have been a cool reward to beat the bases where it's like if you can stay hidden and yeah. kill all the enemies in this first wave without being seen, then then you take it. No, yeah. that's that's what I thought. It would yeah. be cool. It would be cool. Or, or the next wave comes and it's another, st- or and they don't know what's what's going on. Any number of things would have been cooler than just kind of like being immediately seen after right. you know. Yeah, th- I mean that is an issue that I think could be greatly worked on in the in the next game. But I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice to pass the game up just because the stealth sections aren't as great as you would like them to be. Because overall, the package is really good. And I think you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck. It's it's there's a lot of content in it, and it feels good. So I don't know. Yeah, 25 That's, hours. Maybe maybe you can squeeze 30 out of it if you if you dick around a little bit. For 60, I I highly recommend it. I think this is this certainly first of all going to be Insomniac's best selling game. I think it's one of their best games up there with Resistance Three, up there with the original Ratchet and Clank and some others, the Ratchet and Clank remake. Insomniac's really kind of coming back into its own. I'm really fascinated by the schism they had with Sony after Resistance Three and how they've kind of come back home. And have delivered two amazing exclusives with more coming for sure because you're going to get more Spider-Man. I mean, there's no doubt about that. So, and you'll get more Ratchet and Clank too. I mean, there's no doubt about that either. The, the Ratchet and Clank remake from 2016 was fucking huge, and it was only forty dollars, which was even cooler. So, I'm excited about their future. I'm excited about the future of Spider-Man. I'm excited about how this made me interested in Spider-Man. And I feel bad for people that don't have PlayStation Four because it is a random exclusive. It's like a game where it's like you would not expect this to be yeah, isolated exactly. on PS4. So that is unfortunate for gamers that don't have a PS4, but now's a good time to invest in one. And I have nothing to gain or lose by telling you that. I just think that like there's plenty of you can get a PS4 for what, two fifty or three hundred bucks now? Yeah. And there's a shit ton It's of a games. it's a great game and there's a lot of love in it. And there's a lot of especially if you're a Spider Man fan, there's a lot of attention to detail there. There's a lot of homages to the to the movies. There's a great train sequence where he's he's doing the the he's in front of a train, he's like doing the webs and he's like trying to stop the train like he did in Spider Man two and it breaks and he's like, Oh that worked that worked last time. And just like little things like that where I was like, ah, oh, I'm smiling the whole time. This is great. It's it's fun. And it's it's worth your time. Absolutely. And I'm excited. And it's hilarious sometimes. It is. It is funny. It's it's very endearing and very cute and very heartwarming. That's what I liked about it in, in comparison to Batman, which I like too. But I like that everyone liked Peter Parker. I like that everyone liked Spider-Man. I like that he was working for the common and obvious good as opposed to these overt or more shadowy kind of goals like Batman might be doing. And it didn't seem heavy which was cool, even though I guess it is inherently heavy. There being there's well, a got, military occupation. Yeah, it and got I, intense though. There are certain points in, in where it gets pretty heavy, but it never break. It never feels like overwhelmingly heavy. Right. Yeah, I enjoyed it, man. I, I liked it a lot. I think that knowing that this is where they're starting, yeah, it makes you really excited to see what they can do when they can just have a little bit more time. And I, my assumption, I keep saying PS5 is a 2020 fall 2020 release. My assumption is that this game could be ready for launch. And I wonder, the sequel, and I wonder if, I mean, that would be fucking huge. Yeah. 
That would be a, that would be a huge win. I mean, this game's going to sell. This game could arguably sell more than God of War. You can be looking at ten million copies of this game pretty easily. And I think it already. I, I, I'm not sure if I saw something. I'm not going to say anything. Well, I saw the, some. I saw something earlier about how it broke insane records. Yeah, in Britain, I think in the UK, it sold quicker than any PlayStation Four exclusive. I think. Yeah, so yeah. It shows that they're probably going to get into the many millions of range, which is great. That's where Horizon is. That's where God of War is, and, and a few others. Uncharted Four. So, it's exciting and. I like that this is kind of another piece of the puzzle for Insomniac getting back with Sony and basically becoming a de facto first party studio again, even though they're second party and remain independent and work on other shit as well. And it's great that we got this random IP that's not a new IP. It showed that Sony's willing to work with other parties. Marvel and other parties are willing to work with Sony. It could be a great sign of things to come for the ecosystem. So it's very, very well done. I, yeah. I, I highly recommend it. I know Chris does too. Yeah. And just want to congratulate my friends in Insomniac. I'm very close to people at that studio, and I know how hard they worked on this. I know how much this game meant to them. I know how much they left on the mat and how much they they put out there to make this game a reality. It's very difficult to work with so many different stakeholders as well, I'm sure. And so to keep that all straight, to deliver such an amazing game, well done. Yeah. Very, very well done. Now, props to the team because the effort like glows off the off the product. They it's were insane. probably excited and enthusiastic to make it. I mean, that's you can yeah. see it. You no, can they see seem it. like fans. Yeah, like when they're talking about it in all those like video documentaries that they put out or the Vidocs. It's it's uh, man, so good. <laughs> so we're excited to do this show for you. I'd love to hear feedback. I I think this was fun. I mean, I think this is a really effective way for us to do nice meaty hits on bigger games when they come. Instead of kind of weighing down a normal episode of the show where you just want the news and you want kind of commentary and shit, we can kind of isolate six games a year or something like this if you guys like it. So give us your feedback and let us know if this worked for you. I like the idea of basically just doing a high end thing at the beginning and then really getting into questions that allow us to dissect everything. Because honestly, I can't think of anything that I didn't say based on those questions that I wanted to say. I don't know yeah. if you have any any closing comments or feedback. Yeah, no, I got everything out. All right, great. So give us your feedback. Let us know what you think. Uh, remember, you can get all episodes of Sacred Symbols including special episodes like this three days early and without ads on patreon.com slash Collins last stand. If not, please leave us nice reviews, nice scores on podcast services of your choice, but your support really is needed and necessary on Patreon. If we continue to do the show well into the future and we, we would both like to do it well into the future. We're already talking about our plans, hopefully maybe doing the show. If they do PSX this year, maybe doing it live at PSX, maybe doing a PAX panel next year. Very rare for me, especially since I never leave my house. <laughs> so, we're really excited and we're really happy with the uh, the reception that Sacred Symbols is receiving so far. So thank you guys for taking the time to listen. Go enjoy a game. Go listen to, uh, go rather play Spider-Man. Go have fun or play the other games that you're engaged with right now. Remember, there's a normal episode this week too if you missed it. And we'll see you next time for more Sacred Symbols. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Of course. All right, bye guys. Take care. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is fan supported over at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon. And I want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for your incredible kindness and generosity. Azan Isa al Raisi, Ahmad Always, Martin Beck, Fred Bentz, Michael Betts, Eric Bishop, David Blodel, Mark Boggio, Spencer Brand, Isaac Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Jeremy Brokos, Matthew Brousseau, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Andrew Burkhart, Dylan Burns, Alex Cabrera, Brian Cacciatolo, Will Caldwell, Jason Camargo, Matthew Canoy, William O'Carroll, Matthew Carter, William Cashel, Brian Chand, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, Kenneth Char, David Chestnut, Steve Clifford, Chris Cochran, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, David Cox, Cutter Crow, Nick Cummings, Daniel Diamore, Daniel Delanicos, Travis. Mr. Pew, Mitchell Durkash, David Ellis, Albert Escobar, Brian Fink, Joe Finelli, Eric Finkenbeiner, Stefano Fontana, Fodios Frangos, Connor Gassian, Alexander Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Ghanem El Ghanem, Daniel Glassford, Nicholas J. Gorblish, Tyler Goodwin, David S. Graham, Josh Gravelick, Ryan Greenwood, Dominic Rostini, Miranda Grubba, Random Guy Radio, Andres Guzman, Tyler Harris, Asa Haas, Josh Yeager, Clarence Johnson, Paul Joyce, Greg Julifs, Jeremy Key, John Clote, Kevin Kamaki, Taylor Christian Laudrin, Christian Larson, Jackson Lasuqua, Daniel Laws, Joe Law. Austin, Don Q. Lee, Ashlyn Lee, Anthony Lencioni, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Mark Liberto, Lou and Ray Loper, Brendan Lyle, Josh M., Ryan T. Mandel, Michael Martello, Joe McPartland, Albert Miranda, Mad Mock Media, Patrick Malloy, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Brian Nietzsche, Connor Nesbitt, Josh Netzel, Adam Nix, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, Reed K. Parker, Todd Paxton, Brendan Peavy, Enrique Perez, Eric A. Peterson, Jason Pettit, Lawrence F. Prokop, Eric R. Pryor, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Shane Rayum, Jonathan Rice, Toby D. Ryman, 
Schneider, Austin Riley, Ramon Rodriguez Jr., Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, Matthew Savoy, John Scholes, Chris Schaefer, Toby Schutman, German Sidhu, Riley Smith, Gerard Stuave, Stephen Summingit, Ahmad Tamar, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Tam Tran, Esteban Valentin, Adam Van Curen, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Dade Michael Edward Went, Griffin West, Mike Wan, Tyler Woodall, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zaniga, Casual Misfits Gaming, Supershot ST, Richter86, Barrick, Mubarak, Dav9834, Chris, Wyatt Henry, and Donk2015.